Good afternoon. Happy Wednesday, everybody. Um, and welcome to the next edition of our PFF's Disease Education Webinar Series. I am Amy Hajari Case. I'm a medical advisor for the foundation. And um, we are here today on the topic exposed, uh, talking about the impact of inhaled exposures on pulmonary fibrosis. Such an interesting topic. I think it comes up a lot clinically and there certainly is research interest in this area as well. For those of you who have not joined us previously on our um, on our Zoom platform or for any of our webinars before, I just wanna go through a couple of housekeeping items um, as we're getting started. If you will go to the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll see some controls there. You have an option for um, Q and A. If you have questions or um, trouble with the platform or questions about the topic, um, you can submit those through the Q and A button there. Just type it in. If it's a problem with the webinar, we can try to help you troubleshoot. Um, behind the scenes. And if it's a question about the topic, we will have time at the end of our session today to try to get to as many of our questions um, about in, inhaled exposures um, and Dr. Lee's research, which she's going to tell us a bit about um, at the end of our session um, today. Also, we have a great feature. If you haven't been with us for a little while, um, you can do live captioning for those um, for, for whom that might be helpful. If you go to your control panel, you can look for the more button. Um, on mine, it has three little dots. Um, and you can open that up and there's a, a, a selection for captions. You can choose to show the captions. It does a pretty good job. So if you wanna take advantage of that, go ahead. Um, Additionally, we have a file that's been shared in our um, in our chat box there where you can click and download these slides for your current reference or to look at later. We will be recording this session, so it will be um, available to view again at a later date if you would like to do so. Um, I think that is all of my, oh, I have one more housekeeping note. At the end of our session today, there will be an opportunity to give us feedback on a survey. So please stay a moment and, and let us know how you think we're doing and any topics we may cover in the future. We'll certainly take those into consideration. Now I'm going to introduce our speaker today. I'm so excited to have Dr. Catherine Lee. She is an instructor of medicine in the section of pulmonary and critical care medicine at the University of Chicago. And she is one of our Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation funded scholars. Our scholars program um, funds early career researchers in uh, that are doing great work in pulmonary fibrosis um, uh, both cl uh, clinical and more basic science, as well as translational research, and uh, funds these folks so that they can get their career started off and hopefully go on to apply for other types of grant awards and, and funding for their careers and um, get them started. So her research focuses on inhalational exposures, especially workplace exposures and clinical outcomes in patients with interstitial lung disease. I am so excited that we have Dr. Lee here today, and I am going to turn um, turn things over to you. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thanks so much, Dr. Case, for that kind introduction, um, and thanks to the Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation for having me and for all of you for being here today. Um, before I begin, I just want to give a little, uh, you can read this for the medical disclaimer, but any information I give isn't, isn't medical advice, and you should talk to your uh, doctor about any personal medical advice uh, that you may need. Um, so my talk um, is about inhalational exposures and interstitial lung disease, and I think we've all been bombarded uh, by news stories recently of all sorts of exposures and how they relate uh, to both lung health as well as a, a patient's global health. Um, and so, for instance, whether it be, you know, personal exposures that you might experience like vaping, uh, ambient exposures that people might experience, whether it be air pollution or wildfire smoke, or exposures that you might have, that people might have experienced um, in the workplace or in other sorts of jobs. So, for instance, 
coal mining or military exposures like burn pits, there's all sorts of information that are that's coming out every day about how the air we breathe might impact um, our overall health and our lung health specifically. However, when I talk to my ILD patients, you know, they oftentimes experience frustration because uh, they're told that their disease is without a clear cause or we're not exactly sure uh, why patients have their diseases that they do. And so it's kind of... Uh, one of the cruxes of my research is try to link those two things, is to try to get more information about the exposures that we might have heard about in the news or that we might know that we've had in our lifetime and see if we can tie them uh, to ILD disease onset as well as any uh, outcomes in interstitial lung disease. Um, and like other like other chronic diseases, uh, what we know, while we might know for not know for sure what a clear cause is, is for someone's interstitial lung disease, we have some idea or a model of how a lot of these diseases develop in the first place. And so what might occur is that there's certain genetic risk factors in certain individuals. So for instance, there's MUC5B or other types of genetic mutations that a person is born with. Um, they then encounter some sort of environmental or occupational exposure, whether it be smoking, silica dust, birds, molds, asbestos. We'll get into some of these um, in my talk. Um, and then they have other risk factors that might predispose them to lung disease. So for instance, um, ongoing aspiration of stomach contents, um, metabolic syndrome, diabetes, um, connective tissue diseases, as we all know, are tied to interstitial lung diseases. Um, and all of those things together ultimately lead to the wide variety of ILD diagnoses that we know about that are listed here. And so the crux of my uh, research and my uh, experience has been trying to focus on these inhalational exposures um, and how they relate to uh, both onset as well as clinical outcomes of interstitial lung disease with the hope that ultimately if we can fix this upstream, we might ultimately in the future be able to prevent disease in the first place. So that brings me to what uh, we doctors call the alphabet soup of interstitial lung diseases. And there's a wide variety of subtypes of interstitial lung diseases, all with their individual acronyms, which can be kind of confusing. So, you, you know, you may have heard about idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, one of the more common types of interstitial lung disease, and that doesn't classically have a clear cut one cause associated with that particular disease. Um, ILD might also be from connective tissue diseases, things like rheumatoid arthritis or scleroderma, um, or be associated with autoimmune features. So patients who have, you know, some sort of signs in either their symptoms or their laboratory findings that might be suggestive of an autoimmune process, but they don't have a formal connective tissue disease diagnosis. There are also other specific interstitial lung diseases like sarcoidosis and these rare interstitial lung diseases down here. Um, and then what I have here highlighted in red are the diseases that are most classically associated uh, with, in, with inhalational exposures, those being hypersensitivity pneumonitis um, and pneumoconiosis. And so this is what we think of, of coal miners disease or coal workers lung or silicosis. Um, and so the crux of my work thus far has been, you know, while we have these diseases in red that are listed here, I have I have current I have personally experienced as well as a lot of my colleagues that a lot of these inhalational exposures um, are present in patients with a wide variety of ILDs. And so, can we link these other exposure these exposures to these other disease processes? And so, when I started my fellowship, you know, I did a literature review and I was looking on, you know, what do we know about inhalational exposures and these other interstitial lung diseases? Um, and there is some there are some case series, which are small collections of patients um, and reports of these patients that have been linked to specific uh, specific exposures and specific um, in interstitial lung diseases. So for instance, these exposures can be lower level or a longer period of time. Uh, the classic example I use for this is that there's a case series of dental personnel, both dentists and hygienists, um, at a group in Virginia, and they found that people who had worked at a dental office were much more likely to experience idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis at a much higher rate compared to people who weren't dentists in the same geographic area. Um, but there's also examples and historical examples of having a high level of ex exposure over a shorter period of time, and that being associated with interstitial lung disease. And the classic example of that is the World Trade Center disaster. And so um, this group of researchers found that patients who were first responders in the World Trade Center disaster were more likely to have 
um, were more likely to have pulmonary fibrosis compared to people who did not respond to the World Trainer Trade Center. And interestingly, in this study, they also found that patients who were at the site for longer were even more likely to, to have uh, this disease compared to those who weren't. Um, but while we have some reports of exposure of certain exposures being related to interstitial lung disease out, out uh, onset, there's a less clear relationship in prior literature about these exposures and how they're related to out, disease outcomes. And by that, I mean uh, receiving a lung transplant or a survival. So for instance, there was a group in Korea who found that patients who had occupational dust exposure, most notably wood and metal exposure, had an increased uh, rate of death. Um, if they had idiop in, in the setting of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. However, another study in the Netherlands of patients with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis found that exposure to mold or bird or other organic like farming dust was actually associated with improved survival in patients with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So the data is a little mixed and it's unclear if it, that's because of the certain patients and the certain groups of patients that are being studied or whether it's the specific exposures being studied or whether it's just not a long enough follow-up time. A lot of that data is still unclear. It was kind of the uh, inspiration for my fellowship and beyond. Um, and so I, when I began my pulmonary fellowship, my pulmonary training, uh, my mentor and I published a letter to the editor where we discussed the fact that while we have these small case series and these small, understand small groups of patients that we have um, described these relationships between exposures and diseases, at, to the point when I started my pulmonary fellowship, there really wasn't a systematic look at all exposures that a patient might experience and their relationship to interstitial lung disease. And so we wrote a letter to the editor kind of calling on the pulmonary community um, and the research community that in order to identify these inhalational exposures, we have to collect this data. And that's why it's so excellent that since the publication of this letter to the editor, the Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation Registry has, has begun systematically collecting information about exposures on all these ILD patients um, that are enrolled in the study. <laughs> So that brings me to uh, my my fellowship project was basically looking at um, our ILD clinic at the University of Chicago and assessing the overall rates of inhalational exposures among the patients that we saw in clinic. And so this was a study of about 156 uh, patients uh, that all had interstitial lung disease of a wide variety of types. And um, and similar to our under, so what we did is we took a look with our uh, electronic health record, and it basically prompted us to ask five major topics of questions. Um, each questions were very short. The whole thing took about five minutes, maybe. Uh, we asked questions about occupational exposure, specifically asbestos exposure, silica exposure, uh, wood dust or construction exposure, hobbies. We asked about questions related to gardening and automotive work and um, uh, things of that nature. We also asked about uh, the presence of a bird um, in the home or at work, uh, the presence of mold at home or at work, and then some other exposures. And those were kind of, you know, random and specific, including things like, you know, was your house over 100 years old, suggesting that you had mold, for, for instance. And what we found, kind of confirming our hypothesis, was that inhalational exposures uh, were seen in, acro across a wide variety of ILD diagnoses. And about 65% or two-thirds of our patients um, have reported some inhalational exposure. And as similar to what I mentioned on that slide with all the different disease subtypes, it wasn't just those diseases in red. It wasn't just, you know, hypersensitivity pneumonitis. And in fact, 45% of connective tissue disease patients and 64% of patients with autoimmune features had reported some exposure that might have been significant um, in the development of their disease. And, you know, I'm a fan of fancy figures as a researcher, but I'm also a good fan of some like, old fashioned Venn diagrams. And I really like this figure from the paper uh, because it explains that, you know, it takes all, all the different um, exposure subtypes. And while there are some patients, so for instance, 27 of 156 patients only had occupational exposures and 14, 14 out of 156 patients only had mold exposures. As you can see, a lot of patients had multiple exposures. And what this tells me and what I think should tell the pulmonary community is we shouldn't just stop at asking one question. As soon as someone says yes about one exposure like birds, that doesn't mean we shouldn't be asking the rest of these questions because there are probably a lot of exposures that we all experience in our lifetime that may be contributory towards uh, ILD onset. And then the second question I had with this fellowship project was, okay, 
Um, in addition to having these exposures, are there certain patterns of exposures uh, by, by sex, by gender, by race, and by diagnoses? And what we found is that um, men who are more likely to have occupational exposures um, and also uh, exposures related to their hobbies. Um, again, kind of makes sense given the fact that a lot of the questions were about asbestos and silica. Um, we also interestingly found that white patients were more likely to have bird exposure compared to other races. Now, you know, some might argue, does this mean that we should only be asking white men about exposures? Of course not. I think what this means is that the literature that we have to date is very focused on certain exposures that might occur in men and might occur in uh, white populations. And it's even more important to be more systematic in the future so that we can get all sorts of other disease exposure relationships that might occur um, in more diverse populations. Um, and again, just hammering home the point, we also found that patients uh, had a wide variety of diagnoses and we could find no relationship between what type of um, disease subtype they had and uh, the type of and whether or not they had an exposure in this relatively small cohort. And so these figures just highlight in the top three occupational exposure groups. So metal, organic, and silica were the top um, inhalational exposure subgroups. And we found that, um, again, these were pretty male predominant. They were pretty white predominant, but had a wide variety of exposures. Um, and then the other question that came up was, okay, you know, in patients who already have ILD, does having a history 